So let me begin by saying Dr. Ann Shinkwin was born and raised in Washington, D.C. She received her undergraduate degree from the University of Connecticut Stores. She originally uh, attended George Washington University to study education, and then an opportunity arose and drew her into anthropology, and she never looked back. She uh, received her Master of Science from George Washington University in um, anthropology and eventually moved on to the University of Wisconsin-Madison to get her PhD and then that led her to Alaska. She's also done important work in administration here on campus um, and much of her research across the state has, has not only engaged in cultural studies with the peoples here but also very important uh, social work in terms of domestic violence and substance abuse and alcohol addiction. So uh, we'll hear about that this evening as well. She's not only a professor emerita, but dean emerita from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. So let's welcome Dr. Ann Shinkwin. Thank you. Now, uh, we also have some handheld microphones. We have some lapel mics for the videotaping of tonight's. But if you have trouble hearing us, we also have some handheld uh, units that we can use if that proves a problem. So just don't be shy. Of course, you're Fairbanksans, so that's sort of like <laughs> an oxymoron. So Anne, you grew up in Washington, DC. Um, was it a foregone conclusion in your family that you would go on to an academic career? What was early life like for you? Well, they wanted me to go to college, mm -hmm. yeah. My parents had not gone to college, but they wanted me to go to college. Yeah, Washington, D.C. was an interesting place, of course. It's so cosmopolitan. I mean, it's different than anywhere in the country. And I never heard of states' rights until I left Washington, <laughs> D.C. You know, I didn't know anything about it because we weren't a state, you know. And, and they, you know, they don't treat, I don't know if they can vote now, but for a long time they weren't allowed to vote. But it was a very interesting place to grow up. And of course, I became a total political chunky living there, as everybody is who lives there. It's politics every day, what's happening. And your cab driver will have a very good view of what's happening. It's a riot. You can talk to anybody. So I went to stores uh, and graduated with a bachelor, but I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no idea. And I came home to DC with my family. And uh, my high school called me. I had gone to a small a girls' Catholic high school in Washington, D.C. I don't even know how they knew I was there. But they called and said they needed someone to come in and teach. And could I come for a month or two? And I said, sure, why not? So I went in and I taught. And I thought, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a teacher. <laughs> you know? So this was just like amazing the way these things happen. So anyway, so I ran into a friend at George Washington who said, she said, I know this professor who's finishing a book and he needs someone to help with editing and indexing and it's a paid job, are you interested? And I said, sure. So I went to meet this man. Well, he was an Arctic archeologist. Hmm. And um, at the same time, I had registered for these courses in ed. And I don't want to insult anybody, but you know, uh, they were not very good. And, and so I've taken this anthro class and doing these ed classes at the same time, and I thought, this is crazy. So I dropped out of ed, and I decided to go ahead and get a master's in anthro. I was completely, completely taken with it. Plus, he would send me down to the Smithsonian on errands, and I got to meet all these famous people. So were you working for him at the same time when you were taking the class? Yeah. But oh, I, that's great. Well, it really wasn't, but I got, I, <laughs> I got through the classes, but I said I would never take another one. But then I registered for the master's program at George Washington, and uh, we had some great faculty, and so I did that for a couple years. And then uh, a professor from stores, from, um, no, not stores, from Madison, an anthropologist who had worked, Bill Laughlin, his name is, some people in this room will know who that is. He worked primarily in the Aleutians, but he was a physical anthropologist. And he came and he told my professor he wanted to recruit students 
for a program in Arctic anthropology that they were developing in Madison. Huh. And they had three faculty members, all of whom had worked in the North. And so he asked me if I was interested, and I said, sure, sure, you know. Did you know, whoa, 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 did you know anything about Arctic uh, life? Well, or? I had learned, no. <laughs> uh, I had, uh, I had read all the, I had read a lot of ethnographies, mm -hmm. you know, and when I went to Madison, it was really great because everybody, all the grad students were studying the same thing. We were all going to be northern archaeologists or anthropologists. And um, otherwise, no, I had never been up here. So what happened was I had this wonderful uh, faculty member, Kitty McClellan, who I just adored. And um, she was a cultural anthropologist and she had worked in Yukon Territory and had published a lot of books. I just was in love with her. She was such a good teacher. And she studied under Krober, and anybody here who's an anthropologist knows that's way back. <laughs> he was right after there with Boaz. And uh, so she came and said that she was going to Yukon, and she had a grant, and did I want to come with her? Well, I almost fainted, and I said, yes, of course, <laughs> you know. And so Kitty and myself, and then we had two archaeologists traveling with us one of whom is John Cook, and I'm sure people here know John Cook. And um, the other one was Bill Workman, who teaches in um, Anchorage, has recently retired, done lots of work, outstanding person. Anyway, John and Bill and myself and Kitty flew up to Yukon, and uh, I mean, I, I got off the plane, I was like, holy Hannah, you know, <laughs> it's so beautiful. I was just like taken. And so we spent some time in Whitehorse, and then I went with Kitty to visit, oh, we were in, in uh, Burwash Landing and Kluwani Lake and these different places. She was trying to fill in stuff that she needed to know for her book, to finish this book. And it was really good for me because I got absorbed into this group of northern Athabascans, and of course I had read about it and studied about it, and they had what you might call a sib or moiety system. Half of the crowd was a crow and the other half was a wolf, you know, and this controlled the marriage patterns. Well, I think Kitty was a crow, and so after we were there two or three weeks, she came and she said, you're a wolf. <laughs> I said, okay, okay. But so I got to learn to live what I had been studying. Mm. And there's all kinds of rules about you beha how your behavior to people in your own sib or clan and people in the other. For example, strict mother-in-law avoidance. So I had to learn who were the mothers-in-law so that I didn't you know, screw up on that. And Kitty had to tell me, these people are mother-in-laws. And they had, they had a lot of avoidance patterns. Mother-in-law avoidance is almost universal, you know. But <laughs> a lot with, of great comic careers are built on yeah, that. Well, with good reason, you know. You have a person who's getting married who has a mom and dad. They both, you know, want to have control. The dad's family wants to have control. So right away you're setting up, you know, mm. a conflict situation. And so one way to deal with it is to have mother-in-law avoidance. And you don't have to worry that the men are gonna sleep with the mother-in-law, that she, he can't talk to her. So I, I observed all this and I loved it. And what else did we do? I think they even had same sibling avoidance. I'm not sure in Yukon, but in Atna they did. But anyway, there's all these rules. And so I got to participate in the social system as a member of the wolf clan, and I had to be careful how I treated the men in that clan versus the men in the other clan. So that was a big learning experience. Well, I thought Yukon Territory was the most beautiful place I'd ever seen. And um, when Kitty left, then I went with the men to do some archaeology. And I don't know how many people have been to Asiac Lake, but if you haven't been, you should go. Uh, we drove up from the highway. Have you ever been there? Mm -mm. Oh God, it's like heaven. So you drive up there and the woods are good, the water's gorgeous. I mean, and we were in a cabin and there was a site there that we were gonna open up. Mm. And oh, yeah, so we were there quite a while and Indians came around and visited and it was fabulous and I was just absolutely enamored with the country. You know, I never knew there was such beautiful country. I grew up in city, 
cement, you know. So, um, so then after that. Was that your first extensive field season? Yes. Oh, boy, what a great initiation. Oh, I was, I was so lucky, I tell you. I don't know how I was so lucky. But anyway, um, you know, and I had learned to take notes and do exactly what she wanted me to do. Uh, so then when she left, then we came over to Alaska. And we had a truck, and we drove over. And I guess John Cook had arranged to go to Healy Lake, that there was a site at Healy Lake um, that we were going to go and check out. Well, I didn't know you couldn't get to Healy Lake except by boat, you know. And so we drove down this road to Delta, and pretty soon we're going through the woods. And here's a man in a big flat bottom riverboat waiting to take us to Healy Lake. Well, this was another fabulous experience. I thought, this is great. It's totally isolated, you know. So off we went in this boat, and we camped, and we, we took samples. And I had a wonderful time. There was, I don't know if the Kierstetters are their name. Uh, I've forgotten her first name. She was a, she was a, a native Alaskan, married to a non-native. And uh, she, they had kids, and there was a teenager. Maybe she was young. I think she was like high teens. And she was a kick. Anyway, she said to me, you're going to come with me, and we're going to go in the boat. And I'm going to show you some things. And so she said, I'm going to show you we're going to jump beaver dams. And I'm like, oh, my God. You know, so we did. <laughs> it was it was great fun. Yeah, I I'll bet. Never, I had never had Not it. so much for the beaver, I'm sure. Yeah. But... It was really fun. I thought, oh, man, this is the way to live, you know. So we left. And then we drove, let me see, we stayed in the, we, first we came to campus, we stayed in dorms on the campus, then we drove down there, and we went in all the crazy places that were still in Fairbanks. Mm -hmm. This was in 66. Um, oh, wow. You know, so the road was still gravel from college to town, and there were all these bars and crazy stuff going on downtown, and we, of course we went to all of them, and we just had a blast. <laughs> you know, it was really fun. So, Well, at that point, did, had you thought, I mean, UAF or the university here wasn't even in your thoughts for being uh, a position academically? No. Okay. I'll tell you how that happened. Okay. Um, so anyway, so then we went home, and I went back to graduate school in Madison, and I got married, and uh, I had a couple of little kids, and my husband was specializing in Siberian prehistory. And so my, my advisor, who was independently wealthy, said, I want you to go with him. And I said, Okay, <laughs> you know. And so he arranged for us to go to Japan, he arranged us to have tour while we were in Japan and get on a boat and go up. It was really amazing. So we did all this stuff and oh, well what happened is when we were flying to go to Tokyo, we flew into Anchorage and we got off the plane and we were going to stay with Bill Workman and his wife and I looked around and I thought, okay, we're moving. <laughs> you know, I was just really? like, well yeah, really. And uh, I mean, it was so gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. And so it all came back to me, you know. So we went to the workman's, and I said, call John Cook. And Father Lowens was here, too, and he was in grad school with us. I said, call up, tell him we want jobs. And so he did. And they said, okay, we'll make jobs for you. And so I think my husband was shocked, but he went along with it. And, and I was going to do it no matter what. And so we went back. I finished the last class I had to take for my doctorate, uh, packed up the kids, and came up here. And uh, we had a house on campus. And I was just in heaven, and I still am. I mean, I love Alaska. I love the country. Um, you know, I think some people I've discovered don't have much sense of place, mm. you know. Eskimos have a great sense of place. Well, I do too. And I had decided this is it. This is where I'm living and I'm never leaving, you know. And so, so, so we started our career at UAF. And um, when I got here, even though I had gotten a degree in archaeology, because they told me if you want a degree in this department, get it in archaeology, hmm. because they were all crazy. And, uh, which is not unusual. Was that a prerequisite? Uh, the... Kind of. Yeah. It's not unusual. 
as I'm sure some people in the, in the crowd would agree. And uh, so I said, okay, I'll do archeology. span And so I did, and when I got up here, Bill Workman had found a site for me uh, down around a Copper River Valley. It was an Atna, late history, a uh, late prehistory, early historic chief site. And so um, I wrote up the proposal and then I went down, I contacted the Atna, this was a big deal. I contacted the Atna and they all came into Copper Center you know, so I could present what we were going to do and why we were going to do with it and what we were going to do with the information. Well, I tell you, they really gave me a hard time. Mm -hmm. and, but it didn't bother me. Uh, they started yelling at me about all the things that white people had done to them. And after a while, I thought, they probably hadn't had another captive white person to yell at. So I thought, it's okay. It's okay, go ahead and yell. And so after they put me through hell and asked me to leave, then they had come back, they said, yes, we're going to approve this, you know? <laughs> and I was like, well, thank you, thank you. And they came all the time to the site, it was wonderful, mm. to see what we were digging up and what they thought it was and who they thought lived there. It was a great experience. And so that was my dissertation. The next year I wrote that up, went back and defended it. And then, so that was very interesting. But then I discovered when I got up here, there wasn't anybody in the department teaching cultural or social anthropology. We had a physical anthropologist, and I don't know, maybe her husband was too, I'm not sure. And then John Cook was an archeologist, my husband was an archeologist, and, but they had all these classes that had to be taught, you know, for Athabascans, Eskimos, whatever, and so I had to teach them. Well, that was fine. But I had to do a lot of work, and uh, can you just break out a little bit? I know there's sort of general like four subcategories of well, anthropology. There's biological, linguistic, cultural, and what and archaeological. What what are those? Um, uh, and what did most of your students and what did you have to bone up in as opposed to another branch? Let's say. Well, I had been learning archaeology and doing archaeology, but I had taken lots of courses, like in Native American Indians mm -hmm. and stuff like that, so I had some training, and I had read a lot of the northern literature. Anthropology is the study of humans, okay? It's also this human biology or physical anthropology is one part, and we, in Madison we had a wonderful physical anthropologist from South Africa who was a human biologist uh, who taught us human biology. It was just wonderful. And then we had lots of archaeologists and we had lots of social slash cultural. A social anthropology, in Europe they call it social anthropology. In Britain it's social anthropology. Pretty much the early anthropologists in the United States like Boaz and his gang, you know, called it cultural anthropology. But it takes in the word anthropology takes in archaeology, the study of non-Western peoples, which is cultural, um, linguistics, what have I forgotten? Archaeology, well, physical, cultural, biology, and yeah. linguistics. Linguistic. Yeah. And linguistics came in a lot later. And of course, there's linguistics, linguistics, and then there's anthropological linguistics, and they're not exactly the same. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so we had to teach all of that for our program. So if you're going to get a degree in anthropology, you've got to take some of all of it. Mm -hmm. So what was the department like when you got here? I interrupted you just for that sort of clarification. Well, there wasn't a whole lot going on. And when we were in graduate school, and of course we were all northern people trying to be northern people, we talked all the time about why why isn't anything going on in, Ang in Fairbanks? I mean, Geist was up here dragging in bones, you know, <laughs> tons of bones, you know, which are now in the museum. And Scarlin was here, and he had did, done some good work in Point Hope. And, but they didn't, and then there was a woman, and I can't think of her name, who, came, who was Northwest Coast, who came for one year. What is her name? It's, it's out of my mind. Mm. Do you know who that is? Well, she was fabulous, but she was here one year. But there really wasn't, you know, they weren't doing a lot of digs. They weren't doing a lot of research with Alaska Natives. There just wasn't anything going on. And so we were all like, well, we're going to go up there and get this straightened out. You know, <laughs> we're going to develop the program. And that was our goal, to develop the program. 
Were there, when you got up here, were there a lot of women in academics and administration? No, I already told you that. <laughs> well, it's called a setup. Uh, yeah, just a minute. So, well, when, when I heard about this memory thing, uh, and I was said, you know, think about what it was like in 1970, 1971. And so I started thinking about it. And one of the first things I thought was there were practically no female faculty. I mean, hard, well, of course, in grad school, there were hardly any women. Anyway, so I, I said that to a friend of mine and she, who was at the university a long time. And she said, well, I didn't remember that. So I thought, oh, dear God, I better go get some statistics. I don't want to say this and find out it's not true. So I, the chancellor's office was very helpful. And I want to acknowledge Jeannie in the chancellor's office who gave me a seat and helped me get stuff. So I had to, this is not an exhaustive study. It is not a scientific study. I had to use catalogs and go through and count out how many females, how many males. Well, when I came in 1971, uh, let's see here. Okay, there were 214 faculty and 46 were women. So they were like one-fifth. Almost, it, it stays almost the same. There were almost 80% of faculty, just faculty, I'm not talking staff, faculty and research associates, I counted them too, there were 80%. The next year, 72, 73, it was almost the same. There, there were more faculty, 325, but females were still in the 40s, mm. and 74% were males. And of course, the, the professor rank was full of men, mm. naturally. And, um, but I think that's in part because of the West Ridge and all the research that was done up there. And then I looked at one more year, and I was getting really tired of it. I should have come up to this day, but God knows what I would have found. So I, I did 1979, 81, and it was still, men were 83% of the faculty. Now, I don't think it was a conspiracy. You know, I don't know what it was, but they just weren't hiring women. And um, I think it has to be a lot better because when I became dean, I hired a lot of women. It was my goal. And uh, you don't just hire a woman because she's a woman. I mean, you have to look for a woman who's as good or better than any of the male finalists for a job. You don't just hire women, so don't misunderstand me. You want to get the best women. You got to have the best women that you can get. Mm -hmm. So we will have models for the students. There were no models. And then mm -hmm. when I thought back, you know, I had Kitty McClellan and not many other women in Madison and I just hadn't picked up on it. Mm. But I sure picked up on it when I came here and started going to meetings, and there were hardly any women. And uh, when, <laughs> you know, they kept changing the organization of the university from this college to that college to this. And when we came, we were in the College of Ed, which I thought was insane. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, I didn't say anything. I was brand new. Um, we had a wonderful dean. Todd Ray was wonderful. But we had Ed, we had Homec, uh, I don't know, maybe Soch, I'm not sure. But it was very strange. And so then there was an uproar, and they were going to start, and there was a big bunch of people in like arts and science. So then there was a big uproar, and there was going to be another reorganization. And I was absolutely thrilled that the Institute of Arctic Biology called me and said, we think anthropology would fit with us, you know? And we were comfortable because we'd had training in human biology, because you, you all do research, you know? And we would like you to come up and talk to us. <coughs> so we went up there and talked to them, and I, we were just so happy. And so uh, we moved into Institute of Arctic Biology. And then before I went up there, I was talking to Joe Nava, <clears throat> who ran all the business stuff, and I had an archaeological crew going over to Eagle, and I was talking to him about it, you know, and he said, Ann, when are you coming up here? And I said, well, I don't know, I haven't thought about it. He said, we're all waiting for you to come up here hmm. because we don't have any women. <laughs> he said, we're all very excited about this. And I said, well, okay, I'll come up. <laughs> it sounds all right. <laughs> you know? But I mean... That's the way it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, was this during Pat O'Rourke's time? Oh, was when there he a came. lot of uh, accommodation 
for bringing more women Oh, in? absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, he loved women. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, I guess, did the culture, you know, it strikes me, for an anthropologist, the academy must be a rich culture to study. Um, what, what was the, the, when you decided, when you had the opportunity to raise the number of women faculty, what was the, the sort of culture on campus at that time, Anne? Well, there weren't a lot of women, but you know, we had affirmative action was a big thing. And uh, you couldn't go around saying, why are you hiring these women? You know, we could have socked the feds on them or something, you know. <laughs> you, did, you, there was, you couldn't do that. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, my friend here, who was at the university forever and ever, I had been blabbing to her one night about the women issue, and so she came to my apartment and said, guess what I found in my files, and I know it's here. Come on. Where is it? Just a minute. Do you minute. want me to hold something there and let you? Thank you. Uh, well, maybe it's not in this pack. But in any event, it was 1973, right? And the letter was to Dr. Hyatt, and it was from the Affirmative Action people, Equal Opportunity, saying, we have warned you about deficiencies in a number of things on your campus. We gave you a certain amount of time to respond, and you have not responded. <laughs> and so now, we're giving you like 20 days to address the issues we have raised. Wow. Well, of course, one of them was low-paid females, and I was on the list, <laughs> see? And they came to see me uh, in the anthro department. This man came and he said, we're on campus, we're doing a study of you know, treatment of women and minorities at UAF. She said, and you have been way underpaid, and we are giving you a big raise. And I said, oh, thank you. Well, I never thought to ask for back pay, which I should have, you know. I didn't think about that until recently. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway, so it really, the, the feds had noticed, mm -hmm. you know, and had come up and analyzed minorities, and there was one certain minority or religious group they thought there were too many of, and they said, you need to address this. And then, I'm not gonna say who. And then um, there was the issue of not enough women and the women who were there were underpaid. Mm. Fantastically. And that really didn't change much, even when I was a dean. And that was my fault. Really? Oh, well. Oh. Institutional, don't you think? No, I was not, I didn't, I didn't care about money. I was teaching because I loved to teach. I loved my discipline. I loved my students. I loved where I was. And I had enough money to pay the bills. And so I didn't really worry about it mm -hmm. until I became, and then I became a dean. And I never intended to be a dean, by the way. And, um, I mean, good heavens. And, uh, <laughs> Well, before we get to your administrative work, let's talk about your research, because you've done important research throughout the state. I just picked up a couple of things I would talk about. Please. There's a lot, but I thought, you know, and I've been rereading everything and trying to get organized. Uh, one of the studies, in which everybody can relate to, because it's in, a, it's in a location very close to Fairbanks, was in Nidana. And I think it was Fish and Game, wasn't it Mary, who, this is our total person who knows more about subsistence than anybody else in the state of Alaska, and her name is Mary Pete. And she's a Yupik Eskimo who was a student of mine who came to me when she was, what, 16? From St. Mary's, and she's been with me how many years? We figured it out, unbelievable. Too long. Too long. <laughs> Not too long. Not too long. She part of my family. But anyway, she came, she said, Father Loyans told me when I got to campus to come to you immediately. <laughs> so I said, okay, welcome. And she's been mine ever since. Anyway, uh, it was suggested that I go to Ninana. Well, 
I mean, I have stopped in Nenana on the way to Anchorage, and I never thought about it very much as a village. And so I got a, a graduate student of mine, Marty Case, and asked her if she would like to work with me on this. She'd have to do most of the field work. I wasn't going to go down there. I did go down a number of times and I always consulted with her with what she was finding out. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about Nenana because it's a very interesting place, and I probably don't. Oh, I will tell you. Okay. Uh, of course, we went through all the historic records that mentioned Nenana, and um, early, where is it? Early, where is it? Well, I know it, so I don't really need it, I think. Uh, it was reported that there were 20 cabins at the turn of the century in Nenana along the river. And of course, they were Indians. Here we go. Um, yeah, towards the end of the 19th century, according to uh, historical records, there were 20 cabins. And people came there because, well, it was an in-gathering place for Athabascan Indians in the area. And it was pretty much people from three bands, although we found out it was really more two. But anyway, and then non-natives came because the steamboat was there, and there was work on the steamboat. They had to cut wood for the steamboat. Mm -hmm. And so it was in the it was developing very quickly in the first two decades of the 20th century. Oh, and by the end of the 19th century, the Indians had completely accepted the technology of non-natives. And so they had guns, uh, they had clothes, they had steel traps, stuff like that, that just helped them to do their subsistence better than they had been doing with traditional uh, technology. In the first two decades of the 20th century, Nenana grow really fast, and a lot of this was because non-natives were coming in. 1902, they had a, t I thought this was very interesting. 1902, they had a telegraph, and then shortly thereafter, they had a mail route that was managed by dog team, and once they had the mail route, then the roadhouses started to develop. By 1910, the population was 190, uh, and, you know, people were coming in. Okay, uh, Episcopal Mission came in in 1905-06, and then the school in 1907, and everywhere in Alaska, Alaska Natives came into central places so their kids could go to schools. There was railroad construction, so there was work to make. You have to have cash, and they wanted to have cash. Um, what was I going to tell you? Oh, and there was a trading post there. Hmm which was very important for the natives. So anyway, that's how it started. And um, we, the census in 1980, federal census, said that there were 470 residents in Nenana, and 46% were Alaska Native. So we went down in 1982 and did our own census. And um, we found, let's see, 1982, there were 234 people living there in 76 houses. And, and they were mostly native, but there were non-natives as well. And the natives had built their homes and their settlement was along the river, whereas the non-natives were more in the town. And so we decided for operational reasons that we would, in, the, in our study, we would refer to them as the village and the rest of the people as the town so we could talk about the town and the village. Um, okay, so Marty Case went down there with systematic interviews, and they were, oh, the first time I went down there to talk to them about it, and I went down and they took me down in somebody's backyard, I could not believe the wild food. I mean, I was like, there were skins hanging all over the place. I mean, I was just like, Oh my God, and you know, I had been there many times. I had no idea what was going on in that community. And so I thought, this will be a good study. And um, the man who I was with, you know, they were very excited that we were gonna do this. And we had a little bit of trouble in the beginning because they thought we were spies from Fish and Game. 
you know. And yeah, and they were very worried about that. And they told us long, dramatic stories, you know, of confrontations they'd had with fish and game people. Mm. And they didn't want any trouble. Mm. And so I promised them there wouldn't be any trouble. We certainly weren't going to report illegal activities. <laughs> and don't worry about it. And so they believed me. And they said, OK, we're going to tell you who the most active people are in subsistence activities. And there were 22 key households that were busy, busy with subsistence activities of multiple species. I mean, not just salmon, all kinds of stuff. So we worked mostly with those people. They were our sample. And let's see, our major finding was that there were a large number of households that were taking multiple wild resources. And not only that, they were sharing them widely, as in traditional uh, culture you would. And we had arrows going everywhere. We knew who was getting what and from whom. And uh, uh, elders, of course, everybody would take food to the elders, and young men would hunt, uh, did the ducks and geese, mm. and the old people loved the ducks and geese, and they would take them to the old people. I mean, everybody gave to the old people, but the young men in particular did the, uh, the ducks and the geese and took them to the old people. Um, one third of the village households had a, a, a small amount, had a permanently uh, a person who was employed full time, just one third. So they didn't have a lot of access to cash, but they did do commercial fishing, and so they got cash from that. They trapped, and they got cash from that, and some of them had pensions. So what they developed as the subsistence division has found all over the state, they developed a dual economy of subsistence and cash. Mm. And the cash was used to support the subsistence activities. And so older people, like an, a father, could use his money to buy a snow machine, to buy a gun, to pay for gas, so that his relative could hunt. And so in that way, they were involved just as much as the active hunters. So anyway, so one third of them had money, but they all had some access to cash. Uh, they had to. Now let's see here. Okay, yeah, okay. So we concluded that the village could be envisioned as a number of socially bonded local families, okay? So there's, they're in these households, the households, one household is related to other households primarily by consanguineal ties, meaning blood ties. Parents, children, uncle, nephew, not in-laws. I mean, in-laws were included, but they were attached through consanguineal ties. Um, and they, those households formed what we kind of thought of as a local family, because they did everything together, you know, and hunted together, shared together, blah, blah. Okay, uh, and that's also was, has been found, especially in Canada, in other northern Athabascan communities. Okay, let's see. The structure of each local family, we thought, of any size, resembled the bands of the past. They were about the same number of people reported to have been in the bands, and the traditional I should say something about what we know about the traditional culture. It was most northern Athabascan society was based on band structure, which is not, well, it could eventually be a tribe, but it's a, it's a group of people that share a particular area. It's theirs, you know, for subsistence purposes and to live and blah, blah, blah. And, and these were very, the boundaries were well known. You so well-defined. Yeah, yeah. well-defined. And they were socio-political economic units. Uh, and so, you know, they didn't have police forces and courts, and this is how things were maintained on the basis of family. So anyway, we thought it was reasonable to view these people as large local families made up of households related by conjugal, conjugal tries. Okay. Um, and of course, well, let me see. I, th we have so much data, you don't want to know it. We'd be here all night. Uh, <laughs> well, I do want to get to some of your other studies all right. that still have social, but... Um, well, wait a minute. Let me tell you about okay. this. Let me, if you want to bring up that, let me tell you <laughs> that after we did the study, I was absolutely thrilled to find out that Ninana 
after lots of fighting about what was subsistence in the state, blah, 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 that, uh, and I have the factors that Mary Pete reminded me of the other day. Um, Ninana was characterized as a rural subsistence village because of our study. And if we hadn't done that study, because they were on the highway, they could have ended up losing their subsistence rights. Mm -hmm. So I was thrilled. You know, we didn't do it for that reason. What we did know it was important right. to document all of their activities. And then it turned out to be super important. And uh, But that's a recurring pattern in your research. There's been social ramifications. Yes. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that in terms okay. of like out in the and YK. Yupik area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Okay, so these are Indians. I don't, how do we, oh, one day I got a phone call from Dorothy Jones, who is in the ICER, Institute of Social, Economic, and Government Research in Anchorage. And she called me up and said that she had taken a grant to study drinking in the, U, in the Yukon Delta, but she didn't have time to do it. And would I like to do it? I said, of course. You know, so I got a hold of Mary Pete, and she wanted to do it, and so we got it organized, and we went down there. And we, the Yukon Kuskokwim Health Authority (YKHC) uh, had been putting uh, alcohol counselors in the villages, and they saw that some villages it seemed to help, and other villages wasn't helping at all. And so they wanted to find out if we could find out, or somebody could find out why one village was working pretty good and the other one wasn't. Mm. And so we thought, okay, this is a nice research problem. And uh, so we went out there and, no, that's not when I got the sabbatical, that was later. We went out there, I don't remember how long, but we were out there quite a while. And um, we did two villages. We did a village outside of Bethel, close to Bethel, a Moravian village, and they don't want us to tell you the name, so I'm not going to tell you, but you can look around at Moravian villages. But anyway, outside of Bethel, and then the other village was we called Sea Village in the report, and that was Hooper Bay, and they didn't care. I mean, they didn't care if we talked about them. And so we did Sea Village and River Village. And um, so we went to these villages and hung out, you know, <laughs> and we had written and said we were coming, and we had, you know, we had YKHC behind us, so that was good, you know, a formal connection with some people in the area. And um, so we went there and talked to people. Let's see, we went to River Village first, right, because it was right outside of Bethel. And, uh, okay, here's our sample. Okay, we were in River Village. We did intensive interviews with, well, we, we interviewed 16 people intensively with five. And then in Sea Village, we interviewed 40 people. It's a much larger village. 40 uh, people, very intensive with six. Um, and we had talked, when we went to Hooper, I'm already in Hooper Bay, I don't want to go there yet. We're still doing drinking. <laughs> Let's see, okay. And when you say intensive interviews, what would differentiate uh, uh, an average interview with an intensive? Well, we had questions that we were systematically asking everybody. Okay. You know, and we, and we didn't want to leave any of them out. You can have just open-ended questions, you know, and have a rather informal interview, unless you happen to have someone who will agree, you know, to let you mind their mind and, and weren't upset about it. And, you know, it's a sensitive issue, drinking problem drinking. Uh, we were a little worried about it, that mm -hmm. people might get angry, but nobody got angry. Mm -hmm. In fact, they were, yes, let's do this. So let me tell you a little bit about River Village. Um, okay. Uh, and Oh, and all of our results were reviewed by the village councils. Let's see here. Uh, River had a population of 361 when we were there. I think it was 80. Two, I'm not sure. Three, our, our census was 361, and Sea Village was 623. It was a huge village compared to River Village. Um, 
so, uh, salmon fishing was important, subsistence fishing was important in both villages, but Sea Village also did sealing because they were on the water. Okay, what we found, and this is what we wanted to find out. We wanted to find out what their view of drinking was, okay? And so we, we would ask, like how, we, we asked like, uh, how do you call drinkers? You know, in you, and everything was in Yupik, yeah? What kind of drinkers are there? Yeah, what kind of drinkers there are, general question. And so, uh, Mary, I should let you talk about it if you don't mind. Anyway, she discovered, well, there were two verbs that could be used, verb forms, right? And one of them was to drink a lot, constantly. Like water. Yeah. Mm. The other was to sip. And so she began to notice, and when they talked about one set of drinkers, they used one verb form. Well, these, if they use the verb form for drinking quickly, it was the problem drinkers. And so we asked them how they would describe that category of people, and then they gave you a Yupik phrase, which was, those who forget. So these are people who drink a lot, drink whenever they can, but then they don't know what they're doing. Well, to us, that's a blackout, you know? They don't remember what they did. Mm. And in Yupik, they called it those who forget. And then there was another category of drinkers, what we would call social drinkers. Mm. You know, people who drink, and you know, there's a stereotype that, that all over the country that natives are drunks. Well, that's not true, that's absolutely not true. And there was a group in this community that were social drinking and didn't become crazy drunks. And then there were a bunch of crazy drunks, and they were the ones they called those who forget. And so they had set up a system in River Village with the help of the um, alcohol counselor so that if somebody was drinking, uh, they would take them to jail to sober them up. And th then they might talk to the alcohol counselor, but the h people from all parts of the community, the church, the council, family, they would all come and talk to that person. You know, so in, in effect, it was integrated. The treatment was integrated throughout River Village. And that's how they got a hold of the drinking. You know, and if you got drunk, you knew what was going to happen to you. <laughs> so, so, um, and there were terrible things, you know, that had happened. I think when we were there, four boys drowned, and people talked constantly about the terrible negative things that happened when people were drinking, mm. you know, and then these were the problem drinkers. Now, another interesting thing to me was that an AA approach not going to work because they had lots of examples of people who had been drunks all their lives and one day stopped. Just stopped and didn't drink anymore. You know, so how are you going to convince them it's a disease and, you know, they have to follow this particular pro? Well, I just, I don't know if it works at all. It might work. Does it work? A little bit. But I mean, how could the alcohol counselor come in and say all this since they didn't believe it? So is it uh, the sort of defining the problem in a certain way that works and doesn't work between river and sea Yeah, villages? river set up a system so that when a person was really drunk, they would get that person, put them in jail, sober them up, and then there was a whole process. He would be processed. So sort of reintegrated into yeah. the... Yeah, and they would yeah. talk about him as problem and why is he doing this and stop mm. doing it and blah, blah, blah. Well, um, it worked for a lot of people. Mm. And that's why the, it was going down. The amount of drinking was going down. Now, Sea Village tried to have the same system. Well, we had a very nice time in River Village. And I was really amazed because I hadn't been out there. You just don't hear English. The teachers were gone, and we were there in the summer, and everybody was speaking Yupik, which I thought was, you know, fabulous. I tried to learn. I'm very bad with language, but I did the best I could. And so then we went to Hooper Bay, and which is a very large village. And the first day we're there, we're, and we talked to the council there. We had to meet with the council and say, this is what we're doing, and this is what we're doing with the data, and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, we're walking down this 
the bridge there, the boardwalk, and this man who was very drunk, you know, came weaving up to us, and he said, what are you girls doing here? And I, we said, well, we're here to study drinking. And, you know, and he was like, <laughs> and he said, it's really a problem, <laughs> you know. It's a big problem in this village. So I was very relieved, you know, that he didn't get mad or, you know, he was just like, that's really good that you're doing this. And that's really the way they were. It was just incredible that, that they knew what we were doing and they knew it was going to be a bad picture, but it had to be done and they wanted it done. And uh, so we, we got our informants together, the people who were going to work with us, our associates, and uh, talked about drinking and problem drinking and the incidence of drinking, and it was just terrible, terrible. Uh, let's see. I, and this is in Sea Village. Yeah, well, this is in Hooper Bay, yeah. Yeah, Hooper Bay. I, I don't want to move on to domestic violence yet. Let me stick with drinking. Um, Let's see. We'll go. We'll build the upbeat thing for. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Get ready. Yeah. Okay. Let's see here. Let me see if I have missed anything. I think I should talk about. Well, I mean, our study was the first good study. Well, that's what I'm. I'm period. Trying, yeah. On and the on ramifications. The, well, on the study. community level of drinking. Right. It was all from a community perspective, and it, we gave the perspective of the people who live there. It was the first study. Okay. Um, yeah, first field study to provide statistics as well as an inside view of the people who lived in that village. Mm. And then we found the big contrast. Let's see. Oh, well, you know, they had homebrew, but it w everybody said in all the villages when bottled liquor came in is when it became a problem. Mm. Then they got really drunk. Mm. And uh, there were problems in that they would order from Bethel and they, they, they'd save it. And then all of a sudden bring cases and cases, you know, to the villages. Well, of course, people drank and drank until it was gone. And so that was a problem. But people tried, I, I think they got that straightened out. Yeah, no concept so of it. So the study was foundational, though, Anne, right? Since this is the first study yeah. in terms not just of research, but there are a lot of agencies that probably oh, yeah. use that information oh, yeah. and build programs on that. Well, I don't know if they did. I mean, we gave the information to YKHC. They were the ones that were trying to, you know, because they're in charge of health care and stuff, mm -hmm. were trying to get programs in the villages you know, that would help with the drinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the same happened, not to go into an even more negative place, but that happened the same way with your domestic violence research, didn't it? What? That it was used, that it was oh, yeah, disseminated, it was Absolutely. and it became foundational for a lot of Are we running approach. out of time? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, when we were doing the drinking study, and we had many female associates, they told us the most terrible stories about domestic violence mm. that I could imagine, and, and very dramatically. And we heard over and over about people being beaten, women being beaten. It was just awful. You know, knives, everything, horrible. But that was not part of our study, and so we didn't put it in there. Well, we weren't back long. And I got a call from Jay Curtula in the Senate. Hmm. He was president of the Senate at the time. And I'd gotten to know him because his daughter was a student of mine. And he always called me and yelled, Professor! <laughs> I'd say, yes. He said, well, somebody just brought me a proposal to do some anthro work. I think it was up in the Kobuk area. He said, and I want to tell you what it's about, and you tell me what you think. And so he told me, and I listened. And I said, listen, Jay. If you want to do something, you're going to give Mary Pete and me money to study domestic violence in YK Delta. How much do you want? I said, I'll send you a budget in a couple days. So that's how we got the money for that. It was from the Senate. Boy, don't you wish it were like that these days. Yeah, they had money then. It was from the Senate Advisory Council. Mm. And uh, 
So I got a sabbatical because we had to go out there. We moved to Bethel. Well, she, I moved to Bethel, and my son uh, moved to Bethel, and um, which was interesting and very interesting. Uh, yeah, so I love being in Bethel. But anyway, so we went to we, we did Hooper Bay, Kotlik, and Imonic. And Imonic is a large village like Hooper Bay. Uh, Kotlik is more isolated, and Kotlik didn't have quite the amount of drinking. It was just I have the statistics, but I'd have to look for them. But it was just what, three fourths of the households had problem drinkers. Wasn't that about it, Mary? Yeah. Yeah. Which is a lot of people. Now, you may wonder, you know, how solid is the data? How do we know that? Because everybody knew because they went in the sauna, a woman would have bruises all over her, you know, or be walking, go in the store. It was easy to see who was being beaten up and easy to know who was doing the beating. Mm. And I say that because I think it's a very solid base. And, um, we never put anybody in problem drinking unless we had at least five or six people saying that person is a problem drinking. And here are some very specific examples of what that person has been doing. And so, you know, we could say we could stand by our data. Yeah. So um, it's much more complicated than that. But, you know, they had village police officers. I got really interested in that. And I mean, they're relatives. You know, and so your relative is drunk and you've got to go and arrest your relatives. Well, everybody's going to be mad. And if you arrest the relative from another family, that family's going to be mad at your family, you know, because the kinship is so important in these communities. Mm. So social control was very difficult. But if the, um, if the, if the VPSO went to Bethel, then there was lots of drinking because there was no police person there. Well, anyway. The stories in Hooper Bay were just dreadful. And, um, and the women said, they told the husbands, you know, you're going to pay for this. It's going to come back. It's going to come back on you from your children, which is exactly what happens. And um, let me see. I want to know where well, I want to. What was the th uh, ramifications from that study? Uh, well, the ramifications. People requested that okay. study. Hooper Bay is a Catholic village. And, well, listen, think about this. In the past, men and women didn't live together. In the past, there were these communal men's houses, Kasekik, where the men lived. Adult men lived there. And, and mom and the other women were at home, and they had the little kids. And when you're a little boy, after a while, you go with the men and they're going to teach you hunting and they're going to teach you all about ceremony and ritual and all this kind of stuff. And so, and then the women would take food to the men in the Kosaka. He would go home to be with his wife, but pretty much it was a bonding group of men. So they weren't together and they talked about women's things and men's things. Well, the priests come in and say, well, we can't have this anymore, mm -hmm. you know, and so they made them get rid of the men's house. Think about it. They'd never lived together. And so now the men are living with the women and the kids. So and, social disruption. Well, hell yes. And the, uh, the priest, actually, well, there were arranged marriages and, and a lot of the older people, the parent generation had died from diseases. And so the priests started arranging marriages. Mm. And, and it, this, we, this is all in the report. And, and Mary and I were both raised Catholic, so you know we had no problem working with this. Um, the priests told the women, the men are the boss. The men are the head of the family. You get that. And when they would, if there was trouble or they were beat up and they went to the priest, the priest would say, you got to work it out, you know, you just got to go home and work it out. Well, you know, that's really terrible. Hmm. And uh, by any standards. So we wrote that up at length in the uh, report. And so I got a call from the bishop when we came back from the Delta. And he said, we've heard about your study, and I want a copy for every priest that's working out in the Delta. 
Hmm. We were thrilled. We thought this was terrific. And, uh, and then the other day, Mary told me that she found out that now they do a lot of, you know, premarital counseling, Catholics do premarital counseling. And in the premarital counseling, they are talking about relationships based on what they read in this report, you know, and I'm, I don't know what they say to them, but I'm sure that they are trying to tell them to be egalitarian and not beat up their wives, you know. You would hope. I'm sure they are, yeah. you know. Uh, so that was a very good result from that study. And, you know, for most of the guests uh, for these Monday night, I like them to reflect a little bit. It seems to me, speaking of culture, that ours isn't so uh, enamored of higher education. And, and sometimes, it seems to me, American culture looks a little suspect at academics. And well, recently, funding, recently well, it's yeah. gotten really bad. That's right. <laughs> I know. So, but everything you're talking about suggests to me the value of a discipline like anthropology and how it can inform the general well, of discussion. But you know, I think, yeah, it's really too bad that people are saying bad things about going to college. I mean, it's terrible. I mean, I would tell my students, if you don't go to college and, and at least get some liberal arts training, you can't even read the paper. I mean, how can you make a decision about what's bad and what's good if you haven't had some education? So I think it's very easy to make the argument. It's not just pie in the sky stuff, it's real stuff. And um, of course on this campus we have a lot of very important Arctic research. I didn't tell you that I developed the Northern Studies program and that's one of my biggest accomplishments. Well let's talk about your administrative career then oh. because there's kind of light. But we'll try to do a thumbnail sketch okay. of it. Yeah. Well you know, yes, but you know, it was in this last election they were saying terrible things about, you know, you don't need to go to college. There's no mm. reason to go to college. That's terrible. And I, I don't know, maybe I just uh, run around with educated people. I mean, I, I know that people say that, but that was not my experience. And it's well, and these studies you point out really underscore the value that this kind of research yeah. can play if, if a society wants to make intelligent decisions. Well, I feel like if you're doing research in Alaska and if your research is funded by the state, you darn well better think about how the state can use the data. Mm. And I feel very strongly about that. Well, as an administrator, you went through, I mean, I don't know if you were... Um, a dean at this point, but you remember the late 80s, there was that whole <laughs> exodus then and, and uh, economic downturn then, but you survived. So are there, are there lessons to be gained from your experience as an administrator and how would you sort of keep morale up or, you know, revive that appreciation for Well, them? you just have to talk about it. Mm. And I think you can find lots of examples, you know, and we've got research going on in uh, on, on campus about health, very important research about health. And of course, northern populations have different health problems. Mm -hmm. Alaska natives have certain health problems. I mean, absolutely horrible up north, you know, from pollution and hazardous waste and the most terrible cancer. Somebody was doing a dissertation on it and I read it not too long ago and it was just horrible. Mm. So, I mean, I think if people are saying, well, what's the use? That there are a lot of examples. You don't have to use anthro. You know, a lot of examples that you can use. Well, sure, certainly. You yeah. know, to tell people, it, you know, if you want to be intelligent and make good decisions, you should go to college. Mm. Now, I think if you don't want to, there are people who shouldn't go to college, you know? And if they don't want to go to college, then they should go to technical take technical training. I think that's terrific and I think that we do that training. Mm. I mean, I think that's just as important. Mm -hmm. But you know, a long time ago, I think anthropologists didn't care, I know they didn't, about the application of what they were doing. You know, and applied anthropology was kind of a bad word. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happened in archaeology. Uh, a lot of archaeology on the pipeline, salvage, called salvage archaeology. Um, and then there's the archaeologists that do pure archaeology. You know, I don't have any time for that, really. 
and uh, you, if you're going to do good salvage archaeology, you better go, do good archaeology. You know, it should be good pure archaeology. If it's salvage archaeology, it just gives you an opportunity to work in a different place. So, but but for some time there was, you know, divisions about this. Certainly, yeah. Well, um, as we draw to a close, generally I like to open up uh, the questions from the audience, people who have probably worked with you and. Um, and studied with you to ask well, I any. I think we should ask Mary what's it like to work with this woman. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I think we should ask. So why don't you ask her, Robert? Oh, well, I think. Uh, yeah. oh. Mary, how was it to work with Anne? <laughs> it was great. I, I think of Anne as my intellectual mom, and I, don't, I, I wouldn't know where I am today if she had been my mentor. Mm. Yeah. She's my daughter. Yeah. I have claimed her. Yeah. A long time ago. Wolf Clan? Huh? Wolf Clan? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, we didn't get into that, and you know, well, don't let me start because a lot of the uh, Athabascan societies in Alaska did have unilineal structure. Mm -hmm. And you're just lucky that we're not talking about it. <laughs> it's very well, complicated. I see a hand there. Dave Klein. Dave Klein. Hi, Dave Klein. Uh, okay. The question I want to ask you is, uh, and you had some experience with uh, anthropology and archaeology in, under the Institute of Archaeology. And that was only for a few years, right? Yeah. But in today's world, everything has changed and is changing more rapidly. Uh, where does archaeology and anthropology belong in a university such as this place? It belongs right where it is, I think, in the anthropology department. Uh, but, you know, you think it should be in anthropology? I know you love archaeology. But, but the, the average, what I'm concerned about is the average uh, Alaskan doesn't really understand anything about the native people and their history. The prehistory. And uh, it, it seems to me that part of the history of Alaska that we all should be familiar with, um, not just you know, when oil was first discovered, et cetera, et cetera. And when oil was discovered, then uh, the, this had a big impact on native people in many different ways. And yet, nobody is really looking at that that I know of. Well, I'm not sure I heard the last part, but I think now they do teach about Alaska Natives in the school. There's Alaska history, and I think they have, haven't they, Matthew? Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of progress has been made, but I'm not, I don't see it uh, continuing under the uh, uh, oil-dominated economy of so I think what he's, his point is it needs to be sort of disseminated more broadly around in the culture. He's saying not only do we have a, a scarcity of really historic knowledge, but prehistory, as you point out, is not well appreciated or understood. Well, I think people are learning more and more about Alaska Natives. I mean, when I came, people didn't know anything about them, or what they knew was probably wrong. But I think that, what do you think, Mary? I think you're right. S speak up, I can't. I think you're, you're right. And there's, there's organizations like the First Alaskans Institute, which is sort of a policy group that um, is trying to impact the legislature and require Alaskan history taught in schools. But, but can you say that a generalized uh, situation and viewed from by the public? Alaskans in general? Yeah, and more and more large organizations like YKHC, the, the health corporation is like the seventh largest employer in the state. Within two weeks of um, being newly employed, if you're not a local person, you're required to go through an orientation that includes um, information, cultural information about the YK Delta in general. That's where you're going to work. You're going to provide direct health service. 
Um, and if you don't do it in a certain amount of time, it's reflected in your evaluation. You may not get to keep your job. Well, I think I it's, a more, it's a general problem that the level of knowledge, David, about all things about Alaska is is disastrously yeah. ignorant, a level of ignorance. That's what the problem is. You know, it's not thinking. And that's a giant problem. It's, it's an American problem. Look, you know, you know I mean, I, I can't think of any examples in full politics that we would like a fool. Would we? Mm. No, but anyway, uh, <laughs> don't go there. Uh, I go. But anyway, I think in last week it's a very bad problem of our economics, our our geography, our basic economy of how we should treat each other. Joy. So, and sure. you mentioned the Northern Studies program that you're very proud of. You also started the Women's Studies program yes. because you hired me in 1990, and I was thrilled to be part of it. Are there with the other programs that you started? That no, no. I didn't have time, but I wanted to do the Northern Studies program, and because we already had it, we had all the classes, you know, in many disciplines. We had specialists that, that we didn't have to make new things. We just had to pull it together, and uh, I had wanted to do that for years, and I assigned it to one of my faculty members, and it was a disaster, and so I just said, okay, I'll do it, and. Uh, I had a big fight with the chancellor about it, and but he finally went along with it, and um, I it, it when it first started it was the biggest grad program on campus. I don't know if it's still I think it's still very healthy, and um, I invited Judy Kleinfeld to run it, and and I think she did a great job, and she's retired and she hired another person who's really great who I, whose name I've forgotten, but um, I think it's a great program, and of course I love the I taught the first course on campus, Women and Culture, was a cross-cultural look at women's roles. I loved that class. And, uh, and so then I, we got other people to do women's classes and we made the Women's Studies program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we're sort of out of time here, so I want to thank you, Anne, for sure. spending the evening with us. Well, it's been fun. <laughs>